I had a friend, he, 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 he didn't come to a good end, this, this person. He was a real good friend of mine when I was in junior high and high school, and he was kind of crazy. And uh, he was tall, he was about six foot seven, and he was pretty thin. And we used to go out to the bar now and then, and in many of the bars that we were in, we were, lived in this little town, there were bullies. And these were guys, and I worked in the bars, and I used to watch these guys, and they'd basically, there was a handful of them in town, pretty psychopathic types. And they'd go to the bar, and all they'd do is sit there and wait for someone co to come in who they could beat up. And they knew who it was as soon as they walked in. That's actually why they were at the bar. And so they'd wait till someone came in who didn't look very confident and who could likely be intimidated by, by this sort of thing. And then they'd tell them to come outside for a fight. And if they didn't, well, then they'd, of course, make fun of them. And if they did, well, generally they'd beat them up. My friend kind of caught on to this trick. And he started going to bars. And every time that someone like that came near him, he'd go outside and fight with them. And one of the things he observed right away is that almost inevitably when he went outside with them, they'd shake hands and make friends. So as soon as he, and it was really remarkable watching him, because he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a particularly physically powerful person, although he was extraordinarily tall. But he had started to play this game, and he did it for a long time. And I don't remember him ever actually having to fight. He just stared them down, fundamentally. So it was a very interesting thing to watch. But it, it, it was an indication to me of exactly how shallow this kind of bravado bullying actually is. But people don't, People don't find that out because they won't stand up, and it's not surprising, but... Anyways, they load up on food. Pinocchio's carrying a pie and, and a, an ice cream cone simultaneously, and then they're off to have a fight. And Lampwick says something like, it's good to punch someone in the nose sometimes, just for the, I think he says, heck of it. And so Pinocchio adopts this strut, and in they go to the rough house. And then... In the next scene, you see this model home up for destruction. It's quite an interesting scene, symbolically. The kids are starting to burn this place and, and to trash it, and they're dragging a grand piano down the, down the stairs. Uh, the destruction of high culture, about which they're nothing but cynical, because they don't believe that hard work and sacrifice can, can produce something of any value, and they want to bring it down and destroy it. You should take some risks when you're a teenager, and also later in life, and so, if you won't take any risks, there's actually something wrong with you. But there's a negative element in that, well, you know, teenagers do all sorts of stupid things. And perhaps it's amazing that we all live through it, actually, as far as I'm concerned. And some people take extraordinarily risks, <coughs> extraordinary risks, and they don't make it through at all. <coughs> or they end up in a permanently antisocial population. And then they're, you know, basically career criminals. 5% of the criminals commit 95% of the crimes. It's another Pareto distribution. So I used to live in Montreal. Um, I lived in a poor neighborhood. And uh, one day I was out in the back alley building a fence because I was putting a little fence around my, back, my little tiny backyard. And there was a house across the alley down the street a ways where there was a lot of like not good partying. A lot of bikers were hanging around there. And I knew there was a little kid that lived there as well. Anyways, I was out there in the back alley pounding away on my fence, and these little kids came up. And they were little. They were like three and four years old, hey? And they spoke uh, Jual, right? Uh, kind of uh, really heavily accented Quebecois French. And so I, my French isn't good. So I could hardly understand them. But they were, wa they were watching me hammer, and they got a little closer. And they had one, one kid who was clearly the leader, had a real scowl on his face, hey? And so they were watching, and I kind of motioned to one of them that they could use the hammer. And that kid said, uh, and I, I'm going to mangle this, but he said, je vole, or something like that. And what it meant is, I'll steal that. And so I thought, you know, and then he came over and he tugged on it, and he wanted me to take it. And he was quite angry, and, well, I wasn't going to let him take it. And then so, so I couldn't engage him. I couldn't get him to play, you know, and his buddies were sort of hanging around behind him. And they wouldn't come and play because he wouldn't. And so he was hostile right away to me. And then, <laughs> so the fence piece was laying out in the alley, and these little monsters started running across it, which I thought was really remarkable, you know. But it was terrible at the same time, because they were really little kids. That shouldn't be happening when you're like three or four. If that's happening at that age, things are not good. And so that kid was already like 
seriously not happy with the world. And, you know, I'd been studying antisocial behavior for a long time by that point, and I knew that the kids who are destined to jail later in their lives are kids who are rough and tough when they're two years old, but then don't get socialized. Or maybe worse, they get anti-socialized, which is exactly what happened to this kid. He'd obviously been ignored and abused. Um, certainly no one had ever played with him in any real way because he, he wouldn't play. And it's not good if a kid is that little and you can't get them to play. Something's gone seriously wrong. Because they're so playful at that age that like, it's like 90% of them. Anyway, so they were running back and forth on this fence, I thought, stomping on it, you know? And I was right there! I thought, well, I, first of all, I thought that was remarkable, but I also thought it was absolutely horrifying, because, you know, in some sense I could see where this kid was headed and why, at that early stage in his life, it's really, it's not a pleasant thing to behold. If you're not doing very well, especially if that's your own fault, if you're not doing very well and you're around someone who's doing very well, it's very painful, because the mere fact of their being judges you. And so it's very easy to want to destroy that, to destroy that ideal, so that you don't have to live with the terrible consequences of seeing it embodied in front of you. Um, and so part of the reason that people want to tear things down is so that they don't have anything to contrast themselves against and to feel bad, and that's exactly what's happening here. The kids are destroying all of this culture, roughly speaking, because it judges them, the fact that it exists judges them, and I've often thought this about Michelangelo's statue of David, which is this heroic, so David was a shepherd, obviously, and it doesn't sound like much, but back in those times, being a shepherd was a big deal, because there were lions, and you had a slingshot, and so, like, you got to defend your sheep from lions with a slingshot. So you weren't exactly this, like, 19th century English guy dressed in a, you know, frilly blue suit. You were tough as a bloody, well, as someone who would go after a lion with a slingshot. It's no joke. Anyways, the statue is very heroic. And, you know, you, you look at that and you think, well, that's the possibility of, of humankind. But by the same token, it's also what you're not. And so, as well as being an ideal, it's a judge. And every ideal is a judge. This is Pleasure Island here. Uh, it's full of amusement park rides and... You know, one of the things that's kind of interesting about horror movies, you, I'm sure you've noticed this, is that they're often set in amusement parks. And clowns are often characters of horror. We'll leave the clowns aside for now, but the amusement park thing, that's pretty interesting. It's like, why in the world would an amusement park be a place of horror? And the first question might be, well, have you ever been to an amusement park? Because there is something about them that's really... They have a dark side, a clear dark side. And part of it is that people with nothing better to do are spending money stupidly. And they're being fleeced by the people who operate the, the amusement park. You know, and they have, let's say, a stereotypically dark reputation. And they're moving around all the time, which is also something that psychopaths do. And all they're doing is moving from community to community and taking the money from the rubes, fundamentally. And so, the, the amusement park, well, if you walk through an amusement park with that sort of thing in mind, maybe that's also coloring your vision, of course, but it's something that you can see very immediately. So there's something about them that's sort of deeply sad, but there's also that under, there's an underlying horror that characterizes them, that it's easy for horror movie and, or horror novel writers to immediately expand upon, and there's something about it that, that makes sense to people. So, it's too easy, maybe that's, and it's also all short-term gratification, that's the other thing. So you spend your money very rapidly and it's gone. And so part of the problem with the hedonic answer is, happy when, exactly, and over what period of time. And also, who's happy, because maybe something makes you happy, but makes your family miserable. Now, you could say, well, I don't care, but you do care if you have to live with your family, because they're going to take it out on you. So, so the, the impulsive hedonism, which is also fostered, say, by positive emotion. It, it tends to put people into a state of the pursuit of short-term hedonism. It's not a good long-term or medium to long-term solution. I actually think that's why people evolved conscientiousness, right? Because conscientiousness is not happy. Conscientious people aren't conscientious because it makes them happy. We're starting to think that they're conscientious because 
they actually feel terrible if they're just sitting around doing nothing. And so it's a way of staving off stress, the stress that's related to enforced leisure, something like that. You know, you, if you know industrious people, some of, you'll have, some of you are industrious, some of you will have industrious parents, they just can't sit around and do nothing. They have to be working. They don't feel good unless they're working. So, one thing about conscientiousness is that it, it involves continual sacrifice, right? You're doing difficult things in the present, hypothetically, to make the future better. But that's not driven by hedonism, by any stretch of the imagination. And conscientiousness is actually a pretty good predictor of long-term life success in stable societies. Because there's also no point in being conscientious and saving things up and storing things if a bunch of thugs are going to just come in randomly and, and take it all away. So conscientiousness actually only works intelligently in societies that have some medium to long-term stability. You know, because you can get wiped out by hyperinflation too, because hyperinflation kills off the conscientious people. The people who accrue debts are thrilled when hyperinflation kicks in because it wipes out their debts. But, of course, those debts are the things they owe to people who were conscientious enough to save. It might be that the sense of meaning that life can provide to you is proportionate to the amount of responsibility you decide to take on. Not, that'd be very strange if it was the case, you know, because responsibility, of course, is a kind of weight, obviously. And it's difficult to take on responsibility. But if any positive emotion that you feel, and your control of anxiety, and the control over pain, is dependent on the activation of these systems that watch you move towards a desired goal, then the more complete and weighty the goal is, the more kick there's going to be in the observation that you're moving towards it. And, I, you know, you kind of already know this, because you'll, you'll have observed in your own life that when you're engaged in something that you believe in, that the time passes properly. You know, you can see this even if you're, maybe you're reading a paper and it's actually related in some intelligible manner to something that you want to learn. So, even though it's difficult, you get engaged in it, you can remember it better, you can process it better, and you don't, you're not so likely to fall asleep, and you're not so likely to want to find distractions, all of that, you can get into it. And it would be very interesting if that was proportionate to the degree of responsibility that you're willing to shoulder, and I, I think you can make a strong case for that. I've also often wondered, imagine you could offer people a choice. Here's the choice, you could say, well, your life isn't meaningful, the nihilists have got it right, there's no meaning in your life. And because of that, there's no reason for you to accept any responsibility. So, you can live a responsibility-free life, and maybe one of impulsive pleasure-seeking, but a responsibility-free life, but the price you pay is that it doesn't get to be meaningful. Or you could say to someone, no, we're going to do the opposite, we're going to say, you can live a meaningful life, but it's only going to be as meaningful as the amount of responsibility that you're willing to bear. And then you might say, well, what would people choose? Because everybody also always makes noises about wanting to have a meaningful life. But if the price you pay for that is the adoption of responsibility, then it's not so obvious that people would choose meaning over, you know, over pointless pursuits if they had to, if the benefit they got for choosing the pointless pursuits was that they really didn't have to care about anything they ever did. As the situation degenerates, then people have to be offered stupid amusements more and more frequently in order to, for them to ignore what's actually going on in the background. 